workers and he added, this must never happen again. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby died in airstrikes carried out by the IDF on an aid convoy on the 1st of April. The Deputy Prime Minister has denied claims the UK is failing to prepare for war. Oliver Dowden's defending the government after outgoing Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told The Telegraph only Ministry of Defence officials attended a wartime preparation exercise which was meant for the whole of government. Former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has backed him up, saying too many in government are just hoping things go away. Police have named a man they're searching for after a woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight in Bradford city centre. West Yorkshire police detectives say they want to trace 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who was from the Oldham area. They were called to the city centre yesterday afternoon following reports of an attack by a man who then fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital where she died. And a British man nicknamed Hardest Geezer has become the first person to run the length of Africa. Russell Cook from Worthing in West Sussex crossed the finish line in Tunisia today. He ran through 16 countries in 352 days. The 27-year-old said he'd struggled with his mental health, gambling and drinking and wanted to make a difference. He's raised over £600,000 for charity. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The Scottish hate crime law comes into effect. Social transitioning in schools is criticised in a government report. And Bambi is remade as a horror film. This is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. This is a show where we take a look at culture, current affairs and politics. And of course, we'll have the latest from those lovable culture warriors. They never fail to provide us with two hours worth of material. So coming up on the show tonight, as the new hate crime laws begin to take effect in Scotland, we will speak to guests who both agree and disagree with the new measures. As the NHS launches a new advertising campaign, we will ask if they risk making parents overly anxious about their children potentially suffering mental illnesses. And we're going to meet the creator of a remarkable remarkable World War I memorial sculpture which will be unveiled in Washington DC later this year. And of course myself and my fantastic panel will be answering questions from this rather delightful studio audience and my comedian panellists tonight are Paul Cox and Cressida Wetton. I'm good, thank you. Really pleased to be here. I love yes. free speech. Like I said before, it's like my youth club. It's where <laughs> I, now, now the I talk. don't know how to take that. This is where I come to hang out, play some table tennis and, and learn from you, Andrew. Well, that's nice, but I hope you've done the research and the work. Uh, it's not all lazing about. Let's say yes. OK, let's go with yes. Are you well, Cressida? I have buzzing the air content. Yeah, no. I know. <laughs> don't, no, don't let people at home know that yeah, <laughs> isn't working sometimes because they wouldn't know, would they? They wouldn't unless know unless you tell you're them. You're quite right. Like, it's free speech, Andrew. Let's um, just focus on the free speech. Okay. And on that theme, uh, let's go straight into the audience. So we've got a question starting from Catherine. Catherine, hello. Yes, hello. Um, is the Scottish hate crime bill really just a ploy by the police to earn masses? <laughs> well, it's true, Catherine, isn't it, that the, the police have said that they are having to pay lots of police officers extra money to keep up with the demand, because you keep up with the number, the volume of complaints. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this bill, Catherine? Uh, well, thoughts on the bill... Where do we begin? You're not, you're not a fan? No, no. Definitely not a fan. Big oh. fan of J.K. Rowling, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> but um, I would think it would bankrupt the nation, judging by the number of complaints, as you say. Well, it was, I believe, in the first 24 hours, uh, 3,800 complaints. And, of course, there were lots of um, activists online sort of saying, we're going to, on day one, you know, on April the 1st, we're going to complain about J.K. Rowling. As it happened, there were more complaints about Hamza Youssef um, himself. <laughs> um, but, Cressida, it's, it, you know, obviously, uh, this was always going to open the door for vexatious complaints. And we've seen the police working over time. We've yes. seen the police saying they can't cope with the, <laughs> with the burden. And at the same time, a couple of months ago, they said they were going to stop investigating theft and vandalism that they couldn't solve because they just didn't have the manpower 
So, I mean, there's mixed messages, I would say, right? I, it's just chaos, isn't it? I mean, it's I, what, what are they going to work on? Because no matter how much they say we're going to investigate every single case, they can't, yeah. can they? So there's going to be this element of picking and choosing. Something's going to stand out, unless they do first come, first serve. Well, maybe. They? Well, I wonder, though, because they're, they, they've... Hamza Youssef did say that he would not be very approving of vexatious complaints, but does that mean that they're going to investigate the people who make the vexatious complaints? Because then you've got the complaints <laughs> to investigate and the, and the, and well, the complainers. Yes, you've got all of that. And then you've got the people who want to find out if there are any complaints against them that are hiding somewhere. So that's yes. another cost to the government. So this is... I mean, it's just incredible job creation, well, isn't it? Well, Paul, let's just play devil's advocate here a moment. You know, um, none, of us, none of us like hate. None of us like hateful Speak people. Speak for yourself, Andrew. Um, well, OK. <laughs> I forgot that you're the people's gammon. Um, but on the whole, you know, we want to live in a world where people are nice to each other, right? So what's wrong with having a law that uh, enforces that? Uh, because we're all grown adults. And what's very revealing about this law is it gives the impression or an insight into Hamza Youssef and the SNP about how much they feel comfortable encroaching on people's lives. For me, government should be stand back, set policy that enables grown-ups to lead their own lives, all within the boundaries of the law. But what this does is it says, no, you're not adult enough to do this. We actually want to hear about your dinner table conversations. And they feel very comfortable to create laws where, you know, grumpy teenagers can report their parents, uh, like... What? But, but they would say, I mean, the SNP have said and the police would say that the, the threshold is very, very high. And, you know, so things like that, you know, uh, mal malicious complaints, they're not going to end up in a, in, a, in a prosecution. So isn't that a fair point? It probably is a fair point, but why have the law if that's the case? Because I don't think there's any need for the law if the... I mean, what are they actually going to... Oh, you've asked this question a number of times. What are they actually going to investigate that wouldn't be investigated already under the current law or the law that was in place previously? Well, I'm, you know, I do have a guest on in a, in, a, in a bit who supports the law, so I will ask him that question. Yeah. I think it's an important question. Um, any final thoughts on that one, Cressida, before we move uh, on? We still don't exactly know what hate is, and that's a bit of a worry, that, isn't I mean, it? that... It's the, it's the nebulous lack of definition yeah. around the term that I think think is concerning. But look, we, we've got, I've got a, a, a two great guests tonight, one of whom is for the bill, one is against the bill. I'm going to interview them individually so they get their case across. So I'm hoping this will be an interesting, interesting discussion. OK, we're going to move on to another question. Thank you for that one, Catherine, by the way. We're going to move on to a question from uh, Bota. Yes, here. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, should the UK uh, stop um, sale of arms to Israel? Yeah, so... Very serious question. It is a very serious question. Uh, I, I mean, I won't... Unless... Do you have any specific views about that, or...? Well, don't allow me to hijack the show, because no, I can go means. on for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> but if you but can do the within... short answer, yeah. absolutely not. Right. Well, OK, it's interesting, because, of course, it has been six months since the uh, horrific attacks. We've had this horrible um, uh, death of three Britons who were aid workers... Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's such a horrible situation. So, at this point, do we think that the UK needs to s stop arms sales? W I mean, what do you think? Well, my understanding is it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, it's not irrelevant in performative terms, saying, look, we've done something. But if other, particularly America, are selling far more arms, it, it, I don't think it's going to have that big a difference anyway. So, so the, the issue is how... Uh, I mean, Israel are in a position where there are, there are terrorists next door who say they're going to do this again and again and again. Yeah. Do they really have a choice when it comes to... I mean, they, they surely have to deal with Hamas at this point, don't well, they? Well, and that's the next part of... Yeah, exactly. That you can't... Um, you can't... You've got to get the job done, haven't you? I don't know what they can do other than keep so, going. at the same time, Paul, it's really incumbent on all civilised societies to, in wartime conditions, minimise the civilian casualties as much as possible. And a criticism of the Israeli government for, for not doing enough is, is fair enough. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they could be doing more in that regard? It's war. And, you know, we, we seem to be forgetting, there seems to be this whitewashing of why we're in this position in the first place. The 7th of October was now six months ago, mm. and it's like that didn't exist. It's been played down so much that we forget there are still hostages being held today. We don't know what condition they're in, if they're alive or not. We know hostages have died. The UK supplied 0.1%. Yes, of so the total. So really, this won't make a difference. So even if we took that away... Now, you have to look at the bigger picture. Now, I say this knowing full well that fa families are dying, OK? Yeah. No one... I do not want to see this. I'd like to see the end of the war. I don't like to see children or women dying. I don't like to see men dying, even though, you know, none of us like men. But <laughs> we, at the end of the day, this is a much bigger global yeah, picture. Yeah that we need to be seen on the world stage as being a force for good. And I think, whether we like it or not, the only, one of the ways we can do that is through munitions.
It's it's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, one th you make an interesting point about forgetting about October the 7th, because I have to say, some of the stuff I've heard on those protests has been very disturbing. A man openly supporting Hamas, people denying that Hamas committed rapes. I'm thinking, you know, this, it's like, it's, it's, that's either a willful uh, misrepresentation Well, and they're of... still uh, using civilians as human shields, right. which is just not how... It isn't... It's well, not acceptable, is very, it? Very, very serious topic, uh, which, of course, we will no doubt return to many times. We're going to move on now to another question. Uh, this question is coming from Jeff. Uh, Jeff, where are you? Hi, Hello, Jeff. Hi, Andrew. Do you think the Tories should take any action against the Honey Trap MP? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> we know about this, don't we? We've been talking about this all week. The, the William Rag case looks like he's unlikely to be punished. Um, for his role in this honey trap sexting scandal. And, and in case you aren't caught up on this, he effectively was blackmailed, I suppose. He'd, he'd been involved in some sort of sexual discussion with someone online on Grindr, which is a gay uh, hookup site, and he'd, I suppose, given them information or images of himself, I'm not sure what. But whatever it was, this person then effectively blackmailed him, and then he said, OK, and he gave all these personal phone numbers out of a number of his colleagues. Now, look. Jeff, I don't know what you think about this, but he was frightened. I mean, this is someone who w was going to ruin his career. So, do you have any sympathy for that? Um, in relation to his career, yes. But for what he's done and the personal information that he passed on about other individuals, well, I'm sure they're not pretty happy about that. But that, yeah. that in itself is reason for punishment that way. Absolutely. So, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, I'm, I'm torn, Cressida. I think when you exploit someone's sexuality, in that way that this blackmailer did, I think that's deeply, deeply unpleasant. I can oh, understand yeah. his fear. You know, revenge porn is illegal, but people can do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, giving up numbers of other people to save yourself, that's not right either, is it? Well, it's not right. And it's not right because, A, it didn't save him anyway. No. There's no guarantee that, uh, that it would have stopped at any point. And secondly, he was throwing other people under the same bus because yeah. they were being... Maybe he didn't know that at the time, I don't know. Well, they then... Uh, the, the, whoever this person was then pretended... They call it spear phishing. Spear phishing. Where you pretend so you... to be someone else and you contact them and you get into a conversation and then you, you do the same. You blackmail them, you do all this right. kind of thing. Yeah. So, so uh, what was the question? Should do, they do you take... feel sorry for him? Or do you I think feel desperately just... sorry for him because clearly he didn't think this was going to happen. But at the same time, yeah, you, it's not acceptable. I can't believe they're letting him uh, carry on as if nothing's happened. And talking about him as a victim when he's done it to the next people in it, life. It's very interesting because back in the day, the KGB used to target gay people because they were particularly vulnerable to blackmail. So you ended up with lots of, like Guy Burgess, you ended up with sort of gay people in, in the spy network. Um, but it feels like it's kind of uh, the same weakness is being explored. I'm not saying being gay is a weakness, no, by the way. <laughs> the, the, I hope you're not, Andrew. Well, it can be. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, it's, you know, we've all been involved in online sexual conversations we regret, Andrew. Speak for yourself. Uh, <laughs> and I have some sympathy for him because of that. What I can't have sympathy with, really, is the lack of punishment. Right. Just on the basis that what message does it send? It feels like a weak Tory party anyway. Now it's even weaker, even weaker because of this. Now, we shouldn't forget the context. It, it, it is a honey trap, yeah. and therefore this guy has been put in a very compromising situation. The one thing that is the biggest problem for me is the way he freely handed over the numbers. Now, if I was caught in a conversation like that and I handed over your number, you'd want me to be punished. I mean, everyone's got my number anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the point of it is that, yeah, it's, 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 yes, it's not, a, it's not the right thing to do, but you can understand the human impulse uh, behind it, can't you? I suppose that's the point, isn't it? Yes, I think... Why didn't you go to the police, though? I mean, if you're being blackmailed, that would be the first port of call, wouldn't it? Shame. Shame, OK. Yeah, very possibly. OK, well, we, we'll, we'll never know, I guess, but let's move on to a question from Peter. Peter, Hi, hello. Hi. Uh, should teen teenagers only be allowed to have mobile phones with social media apps removed? Yeah, so this is um, this story about the General Secretary of the NEU, which is the biggest, the National Education Union, the biggest teaching union. Uh, they want parents to be able to buy their teenage children phones without the apps. Now, they're called, uh, they're called dumb phones. I mean, do you think that the, the, these apps are ruining kids' lives? Yeah, I'm a teacher. I don't think they should have mobile phones at all. So what do you do in the class, then? Do you, <laughs> do you ban the, the phones? Uh, you try to ask them to put it away. Yes. Whenever they're sitting with their face in it, when you're trying to educate them, yeah. Does it work, or do they, no. they continually do it? Yes. So is that just a generational thing? Do you think they're just addicted to these apps? They're definitely addicted to it, yeah. And it causes trouble in the school, 
all the time. It's so difficult. Isn't it? I know that Catherine Burblesing at, at uh, Michaela Academy, she won't let phones into the, into the school. And in fact, some of the kids volunteer for a detox and they give their phones in at the start of term and don't get it for a whole term, which I think is a great idea, right? Yes, there are two things going on in parallel here. One is should children have phones in schools? Yeah. And one is should children have access to smartphones and the apps that are uh, social media apps are available. Now, in school is a very diff different conversation because, you know, time, whilst times have progressed outside of school, within school, the main structure of discipline still remains. Yeah. We know the best conditions under which children can learn, and therefore we should probably stick to that. And that doesn't involve, you know, Snapchat in well, someone else in the, the class. distraction. You know, it, it, we know that you can't focus. If you're distracted in that way, you can't focus. And look, I mentioned the Michaela School because the truth is these are inner city kids, these are underprivileged kids who are doing fantastically well. They're getting incredible results uh, among yes. the best in the country precisely because they don't have those distractions. So look, yeah. it might, people might say, oh, that's very draconian, but it works. No, it's not. It's a great idea. And these phones are designed to be hyper palatable. They're designed to be addictive. Yes, We yeah. should be having a conversation about should they be banned for all of us. I'd like to have mine taken well, away. Well, look, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can't talk. I, I, I get addicted to those stupid games. I had to delete Robot Unicorn Attack from my phone <laughs> because I, it, was, it was taking too much of my time. Very revealing. Don't play that game. Oh, <laughs> blimey. Anyway, let's move on. Next on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be speaking to the barrister and author Sam Fowles, who thinks the new Scotland hate crime law will eventually serve to enhance rather than curtail freedoms. Please don't go anywhere. I'm Martin Daubney, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3pm. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians, and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs, and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022, that said... Um, Real-world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalise the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free.
Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Barrister Sam Fowles wrote a very interesting article in The National recently in which he explained why Scotland's new hate crime bill, which came into force this week, will actually enhance rather than limit freedoms. I'm delighted to say that Sam joins me now. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Um, I think we should give him a round of applause, shouldn't we? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Cheers. And I have to say something, because obviously I, I take very much the free speech position, yeah. and it's difficult to get people on who disagree, mm. so I do very much appreciate you coming on. And I want to start uh, with a question which I also asked Dr. <laughs> Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people are unclear, when it comes to the new hate crime law, what uh, crimes would be covered, or what scenarios would be covered by this law that are not already covered by existing hate crime law? Right, so basically, this law mostly consolidates things, so not that many, but it brings the law in Scotland in line with the law in England. So it adds, stirring up, or it's already against the law in Scotland to stir up racial hatred. It adds hatred based on age, disability, sexual orientation, transgender characteristics and variations in sex. Now, where it goes beyond the English law is it explicitly talking about transgender. The English law doesn't do that, but otherwise it's the same as the English does law it, now. Does it not also eliminate sex from the Equality Act, the list of protected characteristics? No, it absolutely doesn't do that at all. And it's, so uh, sex is covered in the new hate crime law? So sex is, is covered in the new hate crime law. It explicitly says it gives the ministers a power to add sex to that list, and in addition to that, there is a new law in progress that is going to be a specific anti-misogyny law. And the reason they did this um, was because an independent commission he headed by uh, Helena Kennedy Casey, who's actually one of my personal heroes, um, recommended that misogyny should be a, a separate standalone act. So that will be covered eventually, in your yep. view. OK, so can I ask you about... Um, now, I know that you've argued about this before, about the idea of misgendering, mm. and you feel it's a bit of a misrepresentation. So, yeah. in your, so I just want to clarify that. So sure, in your sure. view... Because a lot of people are concerned about this. Mm. Misgendering will never be criminalised under this new law. Well, I think misgendering is purely saying, I don't believe uh, you are the, the gender that you say you are. That's not going to be uh, covered. Saying, I don't believe you're the gender you say you are, and therefore I think you should die, and I'm going to get a bunch of people to do that. That would be covered, because that's a threat. So aren't threats already illegal? Threats are already illegal, and this consolidates that, that law. And it specifically says threats that are motivated specifically by hating someone uh, because they're trans, that's going to be a, a, a specific crime. I suppose what I mean is why would you need to criminalise the misgendering aspect of that when the threat itself is already against the law? Well, it's not criminalising mi the misgendering aspect of that. It's criminalising um, the hating someone because they're trans. You can like someone and mis misgender them. People do that. People can have a reasonable debate. But if you say, because you are trans, um, I think you're a paedophile, I think you should get burnt, I think you should get assaulted, that's what the, the specific harm that the law is targeting. And the reason that's really important is because trans people are one of the most vulnerable um, minoritised communities, vulnerable to to violence, and that violence has increased in direct correlation with the increase in people saying really, really threatening and abusive things about trans people. OK, so there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, the idea of calling someone a paedophile, I mean, that's, mm. that's presumably already covered by defamation law in Scotland anyway. Um, but but defamation is very different to criminal law. It's, it costs a lot of money to sue someone for, for defamation. So, for instance, I couldn't afford someone to sue someone for defamation. Yes. So thinking, oh, well, it's, it's fine, someone on minimum wage can just pay 200 grand for... Uh, um, slaughter and made to come and run a defamation case well, for them just isn't really realistic. Okay, so let's look at this um, this idea of. So you're saying that this is specific. This is important. I think. If, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. Your argument is that it's specifically important that this includes trans identity. Yeah, I think that's be important because you say that these, this is a uniquely marginalised group. Mm. But the statistics don't really back that up, do, do they? I mean, if we take the murder rates, for instance, it's, it's quite clear that... Um, the, well, I'll tell you, the average adult in England, Wales, has a 1 in 100,000 chance of being murdered in a given year. Mm. The average trans person, 1 in 200 to 500,000 chance. In other words, uh, the likelihood of being murdered as a trans person is much less than mm. other categories in the country. Why are they uniquely, in your view, uniquely marginalised? Well, you've, that's, you've picked one statistic. Another statistic... statistic is that 75% of the trans population have, uh, have uh, su suffered uh, violence, uh, violence against them. So they're more... Uh, trans people, for example, are more likely to be raped than, uh, than other people. And the 
reason this is particularly important is the same reason it's really important that we have laws that protect people from racial hate, that protect people from anti-Semitic hate, that protect people um, from... I don't know, age-related hate, because these are specific problems that make people particularly vulnerable. But isn't the problem the criminal acts that you're describing? I mean, the idea of uh, rape and the idea of violence, those are the things that we ought to be criminalising, surely. Mm. Well, you know, if someone attacks me, it doesn't matter to me whether they attack me because they don't like gay people mm. or for some other reason. The crime itself is what should be punished, in my view. What's wrong with that? Because the, there's co a correlation between hate speech and hate crime. Is there? Yes. Can you give me evidence of that? Yeah, I can, absolutely. So, and I'll give you the, uh, the UK-wide statistic, because that was the one I was, was looking at in my, um, uh, my, my article, which was in, originally intended for a UK, UK paper. But actually, the paper was too worried about the uh, volume of threats that its, uh, its people would receive um, as, as a result of publishing that, that piece. And so I gave it to a Scottish paper instead. So. That in itself is one of the reasons. Um, it, over the course of the last 10 years, we've seen an increase um, in the UK uh, in anti-trans rhetoric. Um, the Daily Mail, uh, for example, uh, if you, you can count the anti-trans pieces the Daily Mail runs, and they have increased over the years. Now, when in you say anti-trans, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I can agree that I think the perception uh, that the number of anti-trans articles has increased is there. I don't think the reality is there. I think a lot of the, what the people are doing, and I think what you do in your article, is you predicate it on the interpretation that women standing up for their sex, uh, single sex spaces, gay people standing up for their rights, that this is motivated by hostility, hostility, bigotry, and hatred towards the trans community. I've had a lot of gender critical feminists on my show. Not one of them has ever I I expressed any kind of hostility towards trans people. Mm. So isn't that about a perception problem? No, because there's, uh, these articles are based, for example, on saying things like trans people represent a particular uh, violent threat to who, women. Who said that? Um, well, there's articles in the Daily Mail that, that suggest that. There's articles in the, in the Daily Mail. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a, uh, submissions to Parliament which say that trans people are more likely to commit uh, sexual uh, violence. Uh, I think, and, that's, I think and that's based I, on... I all, all of that is based on really bad research. I don't research think that's that doesn't people, hold I, up. I don't think that's what people are saying. I think what people are saying is that when you have a system of self-identification that is then open for exploitation by nefarious mm -hmm. characters, who will identify as women in order to get, gain access to the women's estate and women's spaces. I think that's what, I don't think they're saying that trans people inherently are more predatory. Well, they're saying both of these things. For the, the idea, and you know, I've, I've dealt with cases of, of sexual, sexual violence, and I can, uh, can say from a fairly expert position that a sign, if someone is going to commit uh, an act of sexual violence, a sign on the door isn't going to stop them uh, one way or another. They're certainly not going to wait until they can identify as a, a different sex before they go and commit sexual so, violence. So we, shouldn't not have, how it works. so we shouldn't have so single-sex spaces on the grounds that predators are going to find a way around it anyway? Yeah. No, I'm just saying that argument is not a particularly good one. But what I'm also saying is there are specific stories that have been run, and this is... A, you can go on the, uh, the UK Parliament website and look at these, uh, these submissions um, that say, based on a piece of re uh, this piece of research, trans people are more inherently violent uh, than cis people, when, in fact, that is completely uh, not true. In uh, fact, they're less likely to commit well, violent I mean, crimes I'd than be, cis I'd people. Be really uh, yeah. I would be welcome. I'd open the idea of you mm. sending me that. I haven't seen those. Yeah. I've, seen the I've seen people saying that self-identification mm. can be exploited, which I presume you can you agree with, right? Well, I think any law can be exploited. Um, I think the benefits of, of self-identification outweigh the risks of it being exploited because I just don't think it's realistic to but say that, that we've got this massive um, array of sexual predators who are waiting until they can until they can get the correct paperwork before they start uh, sexually but, but, assaulting people. It's have, just not realistic. Well, we've seen it. We've seen men identify as women in order to gain access to women's prisons. Yeah, and we've also uh, seen all, lots and lots of different uh, crimes. We've seen... Uh, we've No, and actually, let's correct that. We've seen men I identify as women um, and be put in women's prisons, but actually, identifying as a woman does not give you access uh, to women's prisons because every... But it has uh, le uh, And legally, every one of those decisions must be based on a specific risk assessment, and so, so what, it looks what, at the individual. So what risk so assessment so do you if need I'm, if someone's being prosecuted of rape? as in the case of Isla Bryson or Adam Graham. Mm. What risk assessment do you need to, to say, actually, maybe a double rapist shouldn't go into a okay. woman's prison? You assess the risk that they pose to other prisoners, you assess the risk that they pose to themselves. He's a double and rapist. Isn't that enough? Well, in, in that case, actually, the, um, the risk that they are posed to by other prisoners would be, would be assessed as well. Um, I think the Isla Bryson decision, they got that one wrong. And 
we get public law decisions wrong all the time. That's why I have a job, because I, I challenge the government when they get decisions so, wrong. So, so I it, could, might have challenged that. So, again, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's yeah. your view... I, am I right about this? You, you're saying that men who identify as women should not ever be accommodated in, in women's prisons? No, I'm saying that every prisoner should be assessed for their particular risk profile before they are um, assigned any prison, whether it's men, whether it's women, whether it's solitary confinement, whether it's category A, whether it's category C, and we should make decisions based upon the individual set of facts, not a sort of broad, sweeping culture war debate. No, but it's not a culture war debate. I mean, this is how safeguarding works. When it comes to safeguarding, you uh, apply these principles broadly because of the tiny, tiny minority. Mm -hmm. When I trained to be a teacher, there were checks on me and everyone else doing so, not because teachers are particularly have a particular predilection for sexual assault, but because a tiny minority do. When it comes to self-identification, we've already seen we have every evidence now that men are self-identifying as women and they are going into female prisons. Mm. So surely that's something we should stop? No, I think that is something because if a man, a, a man is afflicted with gender dysphoria or someone, I should say, and by the way, I should say, if someone who is born with male sex organs is afflicted with gender dysphoria such that their real self is a woman, but they, the, the punishment that we are imposing on them by putting them in prison is a sentence of a uh, period of time in prison. We're not imposing an additional punishment on them of uh, effectively making their gender dysphoria worse and, and but, potentially okay. torturing them. Can I just explain so I that? Do, point, I don't though. want to no, no, but we, double punish people. But we know that the majority of those people who are going into women's prisons don't suffer from gender dysphoria. They are saying that they do in order to gain access. We don't know that. There's not evidence for that. Well, there is. I mean, OK, I'll give you some evidence for that. So the Ministry of Justice 2020 data found that 76 offenders out of 129 trans women, 58%. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to women, that's 3.3% of women in prison are sex offenders. When it comes to men, 168 And this is corroborated by the latest UK census data. So is it your contention, then, that trans people are just three times more predatory than other men? Or is it your contention that people are exploiting the system? Because it has to be either one or the no, other. No, it's my, my contention that that research has been repeatedly debunked, because actually... The Ministry of Justice data has been debunked? Uh, the research, th that is based on a particular study, and in that study, they only looked at the most serious offenders. So instead of looking at the most serious offenders, they should have looked at the trans population as a whole to look at... No, you're thinking of a different study. You're thinking of a different study, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the Ministry of Justice 2020 data, which specifically mm. says that 58.9% of trans-identified males in prison are there for sex offence purposes, as opposed to 16.8% of men. Now, you could, you can, if you, if you want to debunk the Ministry of Justice data, I'm more than happy to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But that, you're talking about a different study there. Is it the case, I, I do want an answer to this, is it the case, therefore, in your view, that trans-identified people are just three times more likely to be predators, innately, which is not my view, or is it the, your view that men are identifying and exploiting this in order to gain access to the spaces, which is actually my yeah. view? No, it's my view that neither of those is true. What's the third option? The third option is you're looking at a really, really tiny sample. So to no, try that's and... the Ministry of Justice data about yeah, all but, prisoners. But the number that you're, the number that you're given is 54 people. Your sample is a... Uh, is yeah. it 54? It's 129. 129. Your number is 129. To try and extrapolate towards an in, uh, about an entire community on the basis I'm not of saying data about from a community. An, uh, I'm, oh, saying, I'm saying something about the idea that clearly from that there are people exploiting that system. I refuse to believe that there is just a, a, a huge preponderance within that prison community of 129 people who are sex offenders by nature of the fact that they're trans. That strikes me as transphobic, frankly. I think what this is is men identifying as women in order to gain access. That's the obvious and clear explanation here, isn't it? No, it's not at all. You're looking, you're looking at a tiny, tiny proportion of people and trying to extrapolate an intention that is not evidenced. And I, so I think before you make any sort of decision about that, you should look at the individuals and look at the individual's situation. But, uh, and that data just doesn't do that. But you understand why women would rather just have a system where men go in one prison, women go in another. I, I mean, I understand how people get there. What I don't understand, though, is why people want to make these generalised rules when actually there is a very, very clear set of rules for um, deciding which prisons prisoners go into, which looks at the individual rather than tapping into what we do know is a culture war. And we've got, the, we've got MPs on record saying we're going to use this as a culture war point to drive votes. And I think that's a really, really dangerous way of de dealing, with, uh, dealing with prisoners. I would love to talk to you more about this. Sam, I hope you come back on the show because I think we've only scratched the surface <laughs> here. Sam Fowles, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
So still to come on Free Speech Nation, we're going to get more on the Scottish hate crime laws with the lecturer Michael Forum. But my comedian panel are going to be back with me in just one moment. We're going to get some questions from this rather beautiful studio audience. See you in a few minutes. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid-single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So let's get some questions from our rather lovely studio audience. And our first question comes from Peter. Yeah, good evening, Andrew. Are you offended by the uh, reiteration of uh, Roald Dahl's book? OK, so this is about the BBC hosts, Greg James and Chris Smith. They've been forced to apologise after telling an illustrator to give one of their characters a glass eye to make her, her more disgusting. And they made these remarks in a promotional video for the upcoming follow-up book, to the twits. We've all read the twits. That's the Roald Dahl uh, classic. They were widely criticised uh, for this on social media. And uh, the Royal Institute of uh, Blind People was also very critical. Do you think these criticisms are fair, Peter? Well, there's something to be said for it. But to be honest with you, I think they should have left well alone, left the book as it was. OK. Cressida, I'm going to come to you about this one. <laughs> well, I think this is a new book, isn't it? They, this is yes, like, like fan fiction. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, fan uh, yeah, they're well, going they're they're to move in next door to some neighbours called The Lovelies, and it's all going to be... <laughs> no, this is really... I read the article. Um, what was the question? Do I think... I, I, Are you offended by it? I, Are you offended? Oh, it was a very unfortunate choice of words. Um, and, and they're saying it was a genuine mistake. I don't know whether I... Believe, I sort of do believe that because who would be so daft as to say that in public? Right. But or... in order to prove whether it's offensive or not, it needs to be true or false, doesn't yeah. it, to some degree? So say it the other way around. No one has ever said to make that character more attractive, give them a glass eye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, you know what? We're not going to solve this. Let's get, uh, let's get a question from Andrina. 
Hi, Andrea. Yeah, my question is, does a slice of cake cure loneliness? <laughs> what do you think? Do you think it does? Do you know, I've never been lonely with a slice of cake. <laughs> you know, and a cup of tea, peppermint tea. That is fair enough. I mean, the thing is, right, so this is... I know what this is, because we discussed this on Headliners this week, and this is this research from UCLA in the, in the US, and they found that women... Um, who feel lonely, they get more uh, brain activity with cake. Cake is the sort of thing that they go to. I don't... Look, I think we discussed this earlier in the week, didn't we? I don't think this is about women. Well, some I of us have got decades of research on this, Andrew. <laughs> Why are you researching women and loneliness and cake, anyway? Andrina, no, I'm with it you. Wasn't but me. I'll eat a cake <laughs> for feeling bad. Like, I don't think this is a women thing. I think this is a human thing, that cake is a sort of universal panacea. Well, I don't panacea. know about that, because so, I've... Go I've never on. been me, but I, I definitely think when... You, I think happy relationships are like natural azempic, yeah. aren't they? They, um, <laughs> I, I imagine. I, no, definitely, I believe it anyway. I certainly don't find it hard to believe. Do women have a greater propensity to need cake? What a question. Um, I, mean, I want to get you into trouble. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, it doesn't make... It certainly doesn't make you any thinner. No, we don't. No, no. <laughs> um, I'm both lonely and hungry a lot of the time. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, I've, and it hasn't solved anything well, for me. I think you look beautiful, darling. Please, <laughs> don't do yourself. Thank you, Andrew. We're going to get a question from Michelle. <laughs> Where's Michelle? Hiya. Hi. Do we think we're finally going to see Rishi Sunak manage to get the Rwanda flights going? OK. <laughs> Michelle, what do you think? Um, I think we might see them, but I personally think they're going to be a waste of time. Whilst I understand the principle, if you look at Australia, it's a very yeah. different setup. I think uh, every lawyer is going to try and argue for months and months. We might get two people on a plane that will cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, yeah. but it's not going to be enough of a deterrent to actually do so what they want it to. The thing is, I've never been convinced by this Rwanda plan, but one thing that does worry me, I think, is the, the notion of democracy. I think, in a way, Sunak is right, and I'm not a fan of the Tories, but, you know, the point is... This was passed by our High Court. You know, our High Court, our top legal executive said, you know, you can do this, this is a system you can do. And then some judges in Strasbourg, who none of us voted in, none of us can name, decided to override that. For me, that's the issue. It isn't actually about the, 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 the rights and wrongs of the Rwanda plan. The issue is, do we or do we not live in a democracy? Well, we do, um, despite what we've seen for about 10 years. We absolutely do live in a democracy. And th the thing about the Rwanda plan is at least it's a plan. <laughs> When it's some in. <laughs> because I, I've not seen anything else. I mean, safe routes of passage are just some words bunged together. Well, very quickly, Cressida, I mean, Labour say they've got the solution. They haven't said what it is yet, but they're going to solve no, it. No, they haven't, and they can't because it's the, Rea the Rwanda sitcom. It can never end. If Ross and Rachel <laughs> get together, then um, that's, that's not how it works. Uh, no, I, I can't see it happening um, either, really. OK, well, OK, well, we will come back to that because that's going to go on and on as well. But next up on Free Speech Nation, Michael Foran is a lecturer in public law at the University of Glasgow and we're going to be asking him about the impact of the new hate crime laws and what they're doing in Scotland so far. Please, do not go anywhere. Tubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this, as backup, is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, 
they're irritating and irritating it'd be disastrous it well, would destroy our now. economy well they would be now but you know um some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that and in fact you know i grew up thinking that everybody had you know at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer <laughs> stove and things this is again i don't want to harp on but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country isn't it so many politicians they just think in election cycles Absolutely. they just think what can i do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election they're not always is looking ahead uh, actually politics aside what is genuinely the best thing for this country 2024 a battleground year the year the nation decides as the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election who will be left standing when the british people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives who will rise and who will fall let's find out together for every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. To Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So, let's return to the Scotland hate crime bill now, and this time we're going to speak to someone who's a little more critical of the new legislation. Michael Foran is a lecturer in public law at the University of Glasgow, and he joins me now. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Andrew. Now, I, I wanted to come to you about this hate crime law and specifically what your reservations about it might be. Could you maybe give us a brief outline? Um, I think that the main issue with the law as it stands is, 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 I think, a failure of the Scottish government to recognise the context into which this law is being introduced. So there's an ongoing political debate about the interaction between trans rights and women's rights. That's, we're all aware of this. And ordinarily, you would imagine the introduction of a new offence of stirring up hatred on the basis of certain characteristics would take into account the fact that there is an ongoing political debate that will involve people exercising their human rights to freedom of expression, and that specific carve-outs would be put onto the face of the bill to make it clear to everybody involved that the expression of legitimate political speech in this context wouldn't be criminal. That's certainly what was recommended by the um, Law Commission for England and Wales when it considered the expansion of um, hate crime laws in England. Um, and it's also what they did when they expanded um, hate crime laws into the context of religion and sexual orientation. They carved out specific instances to say, well, look, if you're criticising a religion or being or ridiculing a religion, that won't count as a hate crime. And the Scottish government, um, in its proposals, did not do that. It initially proposed, Humza Yusuf, the current First Minister, proposed a specific carve-out for um, the expression of gender-critical speech in this context, and then pulled that proposal in, in the aftermath of you know, significant um, backlash that he received. Um, and so what happened was that the bill went ahead and became an act with generic freedom of expression protections, which likely, if something got into a courtroom, wouldn't um, would, would be sufficient to ensure that um, the expression of gender-critical views or other views um, in, in this area would be protected. The problem is that uh, virtually nobody seems to have understood that until... Uh, very recently, and that includes the Scottish Government Ministers, Police Scotland. It seems like the messaging on this has failed to adequately take into account freedom of expression until very recently. Well, a lot of people are saying, you know, even if these cases made it to court, the threshold is so high uh, that it's certainly unlikely that anyone would be prosecuted uh, for, for offensive things that they've say, said. So what is the concern here? Well, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, if, if you hit um, a courtroom on this, there's a bunch of provisions on the face of the bill that would make it very clear that the um, the conduct in question would not uh, constitute a criminal offence, and that would include respect for people's human rights. That's that, that's pretty clear. And um, the problem that we have here is that that's not clear on the face of the Act when it has been made clear on the face of um, other legislation that deals with 
um, offences of stirring up hatred. So there was an opportunity to introduce that, and it wasn't taken. But in addition to that, there's a background context here that we really should have been aware of, or that the Scottish Parliament should have been aware of when it chose to legislate into this area. And so it should have been aware that there is this background context where people are attempting to weaponize the police against their political opponents. There's a background context of the police recording non-crime hate instances, which are not criminal offenses, but could lead to um, individuals having their lives destroyed by a report like this and um, getting back to their employer, for example. So there's a context there that just wasn't taken into account when this legislation was brought in, even though the legislators, including the, uh, the First Minister, were acutely aware of this when they um, were going through the process of legislating. It just didn't end up on the face of the act. Well, Hamza Youssef has said that it's important that the police record non-crime hate incidents so that we can get a sense in the country of trends, you know, that we can get a sense when there is an increase of hostility towards any uh, minority group. What's wrong with that? Well, you, you'd imagine that there wouldn't be much wrong with that if we were um, certain that there... The, the, the recording here was going to be accurate and that there was some kind of mechanism for ensuring that complaints are, are in some way reflecting an underlying rise in hatred. But all of these complaints um, will be recorded as hate instances purely by uh, dint of the fact that someone has complained that something has happened. And you can imagine in some contexts like domestic violence, you might be willing to take a complaint at face value. But in this context, where, again, we know the background context is that there is a, there's there's a significant debate going on about the interaction between, for example, women's rights and trans rights. And, you know, one person's legitimate expression of political speech that's protected under both human rights and equality law is another person's abuse of offensive hate crime. Well, and I, so well I know that a lot of this, issue... Michael, sur surrounds this idea of, of, of that, that conflict between uh, women's rights and trans rights. Um, and a lot of feminists I know are concerned that sex wasn't included in the list of protected characteristics in the hate speech bill. But I put that to barrister Sam Fowles earlier, and he made the point that actually uh, they're, they're creating a whole new category for misogyny uh, to protect women, that actually it's so important that they felt they had to keep that separate. Is that, is that a fair point? I think that's a fair point. It, certainly when uh, the proposal was introduced into the Scottish uh, Parliament, um, a lot of feminist groups um, responded and complained that um, this should be separated out as its own separate um, provision. And it seems like that's certainly what the Scottish government has said that it intends to do. Now, whether we will see something come as a result of that is, is a separate point. One thing that's not on the face of the bill, though, that I think might, um, might otherwise have it would have been better if it was, was that um, there's an offensive stirring of hatred on the basis of religion in, um, in this act, but not on the basis of philosophical belief. So that could have expanded to include the expression of protected gender critical beliefs, such that rather than whether or not this is misogynistic hatred, you know, if someone was to say to punch Turks in the face or to decapitate them or something like that, that could raised to the level of meeting a criminal threshold of stirring a patriot if philosophical belief was a protected characteristic under the Act, but it's not. And so one of the areas where we might have wanted to see uh, better attention to this background context would, could have been in this area where um, the Scottish Parliament could have chosen to include philosophical belief in addition to religion in these areas. And, and finally, Michael, very quickly, do you think, given uh, the fact that there have been so many uh, complaints about this, given the fact that a lot of vexatious complaints are coming in and it's clearly becoming unworkable, will the Scottish police and the Scottish government reconsider this law? I don't know if they'll reconsider the law. I think that's obviously up for them to, to decide. I think they will certainly reconsider their messaging on uh, in, in relation to this law. You know, up until very recently, both the Scottish government and the Scottish police force failed to adequately provide um, serious uh, messaging on freedom of expression aspects of this bill. You know, we had a, 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 a Scottish government minister went on the radio last week and said that she wasn't sure whether misgendering was going to be a crime. That might be up for the police to decide. Now, if you're responsible for this law, you should know whether this law is going to criminalise misgendering in the abstract, uh, which it doesn't. I mean, anybody who knows anything about this law will know that that is not true. But saying that creates the impression for an awful lot of people that it might be a criminal offence to misgender. So the messaging here, I think, clearly had to change to reflect the actual law. And I think that will happen going forward. Michael Foran, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it.
Right, there's loads more to come on Free Speech Nation tonight. We're going to be asking if the NHS are taking parents for idiots. We'll speak to the sculptor who has created a remarkable World War I memorial in America. And me and my panel are going to get some more questions from this fantastic studio audience. See you in a bit. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met 